This, this is an estate garden from England, but I love to start with this because for me, it's, um, it's inspiring. It always, every time I look at it, I see things and go, oh, you know, I could do that without any additional staff, but myself. Obviously, this is a garden that has staff of more than one. Um, so I want to get you inspired, ready for our spring, and um, looking forward to the improvements and the changes you're going to make in your garden, your landscapes this year. All right. So the, I want to emphasize the healthy start for our landscapes is the goal. Um, for the soil, for the plants, and for you. And having a healthy landscape reduces your disease and insect problems, reduces your frustrations, and sometimes that can be a big part of being a gardener, and allows you to enjoy beautiful plants. So I'm not starting with the plants, I'm starting with the landscape, and in that, the reason I do that is because I want to start from the ground up. For gardening success, start with the soil, always and forever. We, the, the plants are very visible. We can see those. We can celebrate those easily. But in order to have that healthy landscape, we need to continually keep in mind that the soil is what makes that all possible. And so we should all as gardeners be have a, an ongoing plan to replenish the soil, to make it even better, which is the philosophy behind the whole permaculture um, concept of gardening. And, and a reminder that a healthy soil, like you see in the picture at the bottom of the screen, is full of life. In a teaspoon of soil, they report, I cannot say I've ever counted them, that there are a billion living organisms in a spoon of soil. Now, obviously, more, they are tiny, so small we can't see them with our eyes, but they all have a role to play. In the soil, many of them are decomposers. They're breaking down the plant material, they're breaking down um, pollutants that come from the air, and they are turning them into a soil that will support our plants. And plants living in healthy soils are healthier themselves. They're better able to fight off insects and diseases that might attack them. So think about whenever you walk out into the garden, um, think about the soil as well as the plants and what can you do to replenish, to improve, to feed, to support that soil, which then will support your gardening efforts by giving you beautiful results. I'm gonna give you a minute to read through this. Um, I'll just be quiet a minute while you read, or I can read it to you. A healthy soil is made up of about 45% minerals, 25% water, 25% air, and 5% organic matter. Does that surprise you? If so, let's practice the thumbs up again. Yes, the no, I see head shaking, which to me would be a thumbs down that you already knew that. Um, and this, these percentages may vary a little bit, but um, they, they remain pretty close. If you have a soil that is rated at having 5% organic matter, you can count yourself fortunate. That's about a, as high as the soil, um, as soils get in organic matter. And it's important to, and which to many people seems to be a small amount. The other thing to remember with that is that the organic matter is what's broken down by all those organisms in the soil, by the weather, by wind and rain. And that's what we need to be continually replenishing. And when you see that number of 5%, then it makes more sense. Okay, that 
does deserve our attention in replenishing that in the soil. Um, the water and the air are, if you think about that, if, we, if your soil gets flooded and the water pushes the air out of the soil, um, you've probably many of us as gardeners have experienced that and plants can't survive that for very long, many of them, because they need both the air and the water in their, those air spaces between the soil particles. Okay, so how well do you know your soil? I'm sure all of you are interested and experienced with gardening and you can answer whether you would consider your soil to be sandy, loamy, or clay. And the ideal is a loamy um, soil that has, um, if you have, well, let, let me back up and I'm going to do again another quiz. How many of you have a sandy soil? Thumbs up if you've got a sandy soil. Not seeing any thumbs up. How about a clay soil? Yeah. And those of you who have a clay soil can tell stories endlessly about how hard it is to work in a clay soil. Um, it's not, it holds nutrients, it holds water, so there are benefits to it, but the easiest to work with is the loamy um, soil. So we all tend to work toward that loamy ideal, and if your soil's texture is, is on the sandy side or the clay side, the best thing you can do to improve the, that texture is add organic matter, compost. Um, occasionally I would have people say to me, oh, well, I've got a clay soil. And so uh, I wanted to add a sandy soil with its um, bigger particles to get a mi mix. Has anybody ever seen what happens if you mix sand and clay? You get bricks. And so that's not a good solution. And so if you hear anybody say, oh, I want to improve my soil one way or the other, make sure they're not going to the far extreme, but adding organic matter instead. And that can be compost, that can be organic mulch, which will break down, could be composted manure, leaves, any number of things that fit into that organic matter, which is just um, broken down plant material at the end of the day. So how many of you have some type of a compost bin or pail or pile or anything? If you do, yeah, put wave, let me see a show of hands, wonderful. It doesn't have to be complicated. There are any number of ways to do this from a bin that comes already to just turn um, to a pile in the yard to sheet composting, which um, that, that this is a whole nother talk. But there are many, many ways to do it that can be pretty straightforward and simple. I call compost black gold for your soil because it, uh, it amends the texture, giving you that loamy texture. It has um, small amounts of the nutrients that the soil needs, doesn't have to cost a penny. Um, and a compost, if you've got a pile, you know that the more you turn it, the faster you get compost, but you don't have to, as long as it has the compost materials and water and air, it will eventually turn whatever you have in, in there into compost. Now, what, my first tip for the evening in, is that if you like to have, maybe in the front of your home, some of the more expensive mulches, um, you can put down a two inch layer of compost under a two inch layer of that premium mulch 
The mulch is what people see, gives it that look you like, but you have added the compost, which will break down, work into the soil and help improve the soil. It's a pretty easy way to put organic matter back into your soil. All right. So how many of you have what I call GHTP syndrome? GHTP stands for gotta have that plant. I'm, yeah, is there anybody who doesn't have that? <laughs> oh, we, we are at somebody's house, we're at a garden center, and, and how many times do we see that? It's not unusual that we have no idea where that plant's going to go, but we know we're going to find a place for it because it, it excites us and we really want to have that in our landscape. Um, it's a little early to be doing much shopping at the garden centers and the nurseries. So when is it safe to plant those new plants that we um, will start purchasing soon? If at all possible, wait until the ground has, the soil has thawed. Um, and then as you learn a little bit more about the plant, um, it's all, the, the critical piece is the soil temperature, not the air temperature, but the soil temperature. So in the next slide, I'm gonna talk about learning more about the plants as you try and figure out where they will fit in your landscape and thrive. And I, I'm try, I tell for that because trial and error, I have added <laughs> plants to my landscape where I wanted them to be showy, but it wasn't necessarily the right place for them. And they struggled and I was frustrated and they weren't happy. And so it's always a good idea to learn about the plants before you put them into your landscape. And when you plant that new plant, should it be fertilized? Um, if you want to add a little bit of slow release fertilizer to the planting hole, you can do that. With perennials, you rarely is fertilization needed. If you've got a healthy soil, they can get everything they need from your soil. Um, the woody ornaments, the woody shrubs, um, sometimes people who grow the pink slash blue hydrangeas like to play with the color. In that case, you're going to have to add either an acidic or a base fertilizer to change those colors. Um, sometimes I add a little bit of fertilizer for those shrubs that are heavy feeders, heavy bloomers. Um, just remember if you are doing that, for example, if, if you wanna add some fertilizer for your rhododendrons, um, a reminder that it takes some time for fertilizer to get incorporated into the soil, taken up by the plant roots and then to travel throughout the plant. So it won't make a difference in just a matter of a few days or a few weeks. So keep that in mind so you don't get frustrated. Oh, I think there was another, there was, um, so <laughs> this is what we face this time of the year, is an awareness that frost is still a regular occurrence and Marshall's frost-free date, the date when it's pretty safe that there won't be any more spring frost is May 27th. Um, if we get a stretch of nice sunny weather like we've had um, in the past week, it can be really tempting to be out there planting our vegetable plants or doing other gardening tasks. It's always important to remember that here in Michigan, we can get those cold nights that can um, undo your gardening efforts. So keep an eye on the weather and have a plan in place about what you'll do if you have tender plants in your landscape. Um, and in the case of the um, evergreen on the left that the tips got frosted, in a case like that, um, people will may ask you as a gardener, oh, is my plant dead? Do I need to take it out? No, um, you probably already know. If you just prune out that dead, um, the plant will be fine. 
There are years we get frosts hard enough to kill the leaves that have emerged even on our trees. The trees will send out a second flush of leaves. It won't be as thick as the first one, but the plants try very, very hard to survive. So as I said, it's always a good idea to learn about plant preferences before you put them into the soil. What kind of conditions do they like? How cold tolerant are they? What's the best place in your landscape for them? And I, again, through trial and error, I have learned that there are some plants that just do not thrive in my landscape. Lupins are one. I cannot grow those here for anything. Can't tell you how many times I've tried, how many times I've tried to make amendments to and changed where I put them, but I'm just, I'm a wet boggy site and they just do not like it here. And there are, um, if you want, I can share with you, if you don't already have some good plant databases to look up and find this information, I'll be happy to share that with you after the presentation. And then the next tip is don't forget to give some TLC to plants once you're planted them to give them a healthy start. And what does that mean? That means that with perennials, for about the first year, make sure that they don't get complete, the soil doesn't get completely dried out and keep an extra eye on them for any insect or disease issues that might become, um, might negatively affect their health. So just be aware. Now with shrubs, I say two to three years, a little extra TLC. And with trees, about three, maybe even as much as five years to just give them a chance for their root systems to get well established in your landscape. And you will end up with healthier, more beautiful plants for years to come. I put, and I apologize, this diagram blown up is a little bit blurry, um, but so if you just look at, this is a, the way we currently recommend that people plant trees. This can be adapted to shrubs. Um, the critical parts are the same or perennials. And basically dig a hole that's two to three times as wide as your root ball but the same depth um, used to be, we said, no, make the hole deeper, loosen up that soil underneath, get the roots to go deep. What we found was that the root ball would settle and the flare or the trunk flare would then be below the top of the soil level, which has a negative impact on the health of trees. Um, so mix about half, if your soil is less than ideal, mix about half of your soil with nice compost um, to use in the planting hole. Loosen the roots if you can, the outside of the roots, because we found that roots that are growing in a circle, as they often do when they're in a root ball or a pot, they want to continue to do that even when you put them in the soil. So if you can loosen those roots so that they are headed out and down, that will help establish a healthier plant also. Fill it in um, gently using water to settle the soil, get rid of air bubbles. Then do a two to four inch layer of mulch on the top of the planting hole, but leave a couple of inches with no mulch around the base of the trunk. And if you need to stake, like you're in a really windy spot or it, um, you have a sandy soil, that's fine. But as a general rule, we say don't stake. If you do, don't make it so tight that the tree can't move. The tree needs to be able to move in the wind. That helps, that stimulates root growth. So you end up with a more well-established tree in the long run. And if you do need to stake, don't leave those on for more than a year. Okay, that's a lot of information. And as I said, the same can apply to a shrub. Um, same can apply to perennials. 
I had a professor at MSU who said, if you spend $200 on a tree, spend $400 for the planting hole. Now that was a little bit of an exaggeration, but his point was what you can do at the very beginning to get it off to a good healthy start pays benefits for years to come. Okay, now gardening without weeds. Is it possible? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, yeah. I haven't found a way to do it without a lot of effort on, on my part. There are a number of things out there, um, and I thought I would um, share those. I'd, I'll start with the one that I haven't tried. The, in the bottom left corner is the weed robot. Have you seen video of that? It, like the um, Roomba vacuum, it moves around your garden bed, cutting off the plants that it encounters. So to me, it doesn't save anything because you have to put some protection around the plants. You don't want it to cut off. And then if you're a gardener, you know that cutting off the top of the plant doesn't get rid of the roots. And so those weeds will come back again. But I, I don't know anybody who has actually purchased one of these for fun, but it could be kind of entertaining to have a robot running around your garden um, to entertain the neighbors at the very least. Uh, the, the best, you know, the, I already am seeing spring weeds in my garden beds. And my best advice is get them while they're young, get them before they have a chance to get, set seeds. Um, because once they set seeds, those will explode all over and you will have a return of those weeds again next year. Um, and I know that can be a lot of work, but once you get the soil cleaned, sometimes people use preen or corn gluten and those um, prevent weeds from sprouting. How many of you have tried preen or corn gluten. Okay, a few of you have. Do um, did you have success? Those of you who used it. Okay, good. Um, if you didn't, let I'll explain briefly how that works. Once you get your soil cleaned, um, then you put down the preen, and you need to then let it be. Don't disturb that barrier. What it does is it creates a barrier so that the um, seeds in the soil aren't getting the light and the moisture they need to sprout. So if you put it down and then you're out there walking through that bed, um, you, you can break that barrier and then it won't work at all. So, one, so you wanna get it clean first, put the preen down in an area and in a way where you can just let it be. Um, and let it do its thing. And that's how that works. Then the other one I wanna talk about, you probably all have seen online multiple times, the homemade weed killers. Um, they can, there can be different ingredients. Usually there is white vinegar. Um, sometimes table salt, sometimes Epsom salts. Um, sometimes dish soap. And I want to talk about where the thinking comes for this homemade weed killer. The idea is that it is safer than using a chemical weed killer. The white vinegar will kill the plant tissue that it touches. So if you spray it on the leaves, it will kill those leaves. Again, it does not kill the roots. It is not translocated into the roots. Salt, um, I, I don't recommend that anybody add any type of salt to your soil unless you have a soil test report that says to do that. Um, salts can be extremely toxic to roots. Uh, and Epsom salts, the Historically and in agriculture, Epsom salts have been used sometimes 
on a large scale basis. That's a very controlled thing. I wouldn't recommend putting it into a spray bottle where you are, you, who knows how many times you will have to use that. The dish soap serves two purposes. It's what we call a surfactant. It can help hold the spray on the plant tissue um, a little bit longer. It also can smother some insects. If uh, their bodies get coated with it, it prevents, it, it will actually pull the moisture out of their bodies and kill them. Um, so I wanted you to understand those components and what they do and how they work. So that if you are choosing to use a homemade recipe, um, you know what it will do and what it won't do. And my caution would be stay away from salt, any type of salt, unless you have a, a soil test report that says that you need it. Best thing is removing them, the weeds quickly when they first show up and <laughs> repeatedly. We all know that as gardeners, don't we? Okay, oh, my mouse went to sleep. There we go. Another thing that can help you with the meat, um, maintenance and the keeping the weeds down is the mulch. And I've talked about it now a couple of times. It can improve soil texture. As it breaks down, it can add small amounts of nutrients to the soil. Um, many people think that that's attractive, more attractive than open soil. Um, and uh, now is a great time to refresh your mulch. Or many of us, and I do this, uh, the leaves that fall in last fall and through the winter, I leave them in my garden beds and I do not usually remove them unless they're way more than the four inch depth that we recommend for mulch. But in the spring, they've been under the snow, they've been rained on, they are matted. And so I take a light, either a plastic or a bamboo rake and I fluff those leaves up. And if they, are, if they really haven't broken down much, I may actually um, try and do some chopping, run them, try and pull them out of the bed and do a mulching mower over them and put them back in. That's great um, mulch and it will break down, will add the nutrients. And then if that's not the look you want for your bed, you can put a more decorative mulch over the top. And now is a great time to start fluffing those leaves. We may get snow, but it won't be too much or for too long, we hope. And um, loosen that up so that air gets in there and so that the plants that are emerging can work their way through and up into the sunlight. And we recommend that mulch be two to four inches deep, less than two inches, and it really doesn't help with moisture retention or weed um, discouragement or anything. More than four inches deep, and you can be creating a moist, dark environment where fungal spores can just go crazy. And then the fungal spores will get splashed onto your um, plant leaves and, and trunks and can cause all kinds of issues for you. The thing to remember is to leave um, one to two inches of space around the trunk of your plants um, be, so that that mulch isn't right up against the trunk. Again, that can cause a moist, dark space where fungal issues can settle in and cause problems for the health of your plant. And before you mulch, remove the weeds first. <laughs> You'll be glad later. Um, it's always nice. It, we'd always like to think that we can smother them, but with two to four inches, you probably won't smother most of them, depending on what the weeds are. The other thing I would consider you think about, and maybe some of you do this already, is what I call living mulch. All the benefits of mulch, but you get ornamental appeal. They attract beneficial insects, smell good, and um, 
people sometimes say, but don't they actually draw moisture out of the soil? With these low growing ground covers like alyssum, which you see on the bottom, um, their root systems don't go very deep. So they are not pulling much moisture out of your soil at all. And it's offset by the fact that they're providing shade and protection from the wind, which reduces evaporation. So it really doesn't make your soil any drier. And it, the alyssum is nice because it will grow in shady conditions under other plants. And you, it spreads and it blossoms all summer. And it's a, it is one of the best plants you can grow to attract beneficial insects. So as gardeners, we're always looking for space to add new plants. There you go. Okay, we'll move on for a few minutes now to the lawn. Um, what can you safely do now? You can pick up the sticks and boy, that's, I've done that all winter long. We've had a lot of big windy events this winter and all of the dead branches in all of our trees, I think have been blown down to the ground. Clean up those poo piles that are in the lawn before the mowers come out. Um, if you have areas like by the driveway or the mailbox where the turf grass got especially matted by the snow from the snow blower, rake that lightly um, and that will help prevent snow mold. It's getting to be close to time for crabgrass preventer. Uh, when is the optimum time for application? And that when those products are sensitive to temperature in the soil, um, and I'm going to show you a way to help you decide when to do that. It's recommended that you wait until May to fertilize your lawn. And the reason for that is now the turf grass plants should be focusing their energy on the roots in order to get them strengthened for the season to come. If you put down a fertilizer with nitrogen now, you are stimulating the top growth and taking away from the root growth. So hold off for a while before you add that first nitrogen fertilizer, if you do that. And remember that if you um, use a mulching mower, you're putting the clippings back into the lawn, which is adding nitrogen back into the lawn every time you mow. And this is the little, this is a tool you can use for helping with not only crabgrass pre-emergent, but other things. And this is the um, dot is Marshall. This is called the GDD tracker. It's sponsored by MSU. GDD just stands for growing degree days. It's a way that they measure how many days, how, when to plant, when to put down treatments, so that really doesn't matter for your purposes. But if you look at this and you look down at the bottom, you can see that the gold color is, it, it shows the, um, as of the 19th of March, the for crabgrass pre-emergent, we're just getting ready to enter the early application window. The green is the optimum, and you can check this. This gets updated on a daily basis, so you can check to see when is the ideal time to put down that crabgrass pre-emergent or any of these other um, issues that you may be treating your turf grass for. So if you just search online for GDD tracker, it will pop up. You can choose your, put in your zip code, and it will, this is what you will see. Fertilizing the lawn, the most important time is late fall. Again, the reason for that is to build up the roots. Healthy roots mean a healthier top growth. The second most important time is May to add that nitrogen. And then if you are mulching your grass clippings into the lawn, you're adding nitrogen every time you mow. And that um, takes care of much of the need that your lawn has for 
that. And a reminder, turf grass is the most demanding plant that we grow. Um, takes the most water, takes the most input on your part, probably is the biggest expense on your part. Um, so anything you can do to save a little time and money is, um, I appreciate at least. Tips for success. It works better if you can water deeply and infrequently. Um, and the, there are a couple of reasons for that. If you're watering deeply, so the water, your irrigation water is getting all the way through the root zone of the turf grass, which you know is only about four to six inches. That encourages the roots to grow deeper. What that does is makes for stronger plants because the deeper roots can reach, pull more moisture to help support the plants. Um, infrequently, people who run an irrigation system every day are much more likely to have fungus disease issues and insect issues because you're creating this moist habitat that they love to thrive in. So if you can water a little less often and water a little longer when you do, you will find that you have healthier turf grass plants. And a healthier turf means fewer weeds. It's also recommended that your mower height be as high as you can set it. Three inches is considered ideal. Again, that, that ends up providing you with healthier plants. The shorter cut, like we see on golf course greens, requires more food um, because there's less grass blade to soak up the sun and photosynthesize. And when we are um, fertilizing the lawn, um, we're fertile, the three, well, or any fertilizer, the, a blended fertilizer. Well, there are three main nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And those are the numbers that you see on a bag of fertilizer. First one is nitrogen, or no, P and PK. First one is nitrogen, second one is phosphorus, third one is potassium. The phosphorus, that middle number, um, the law in Michigan now is that general lawn fertilizers should not have any phosphorus or only a very small amount. The reason is that phosphorus, our soils have plenty of phosphorus in them. And the, so the phosphorus does not break down quickly. It does not move through the soil quickly. So it's there. And adding more phosphorus, what ends up happening is it just washes through into the groundwater, into our streams, rivers, lakes, and it stimulates algae growth. And anybody who lives along a waterway knows that algae can be a nightmare. So um, you want to, for unless you are starting new lawn, your lawn fertilizer should have that middle number, the zero or one or maybe two at the highest. Now, to find out what is already in your soil so you know what you need to add, um, test your soil. And we're back to the responses. How many of you have had a soil test done in the last couple of years? Thumbs up or wave a hand. Thumbs down, okay. Um, if you haven't, I would encourage you to consider it. And now's a great time. It's easy to, to get out there. If you get your soil submitted now, the um, soil test labs aren't um, at their busiest yet. So you'll get response within a couple of weeks. The MSU soil test kit costs $25. Looks like what you see on the screen. It comes with everything you need except for the soil. Instructions, a mailer, you mail it into the soil lab. They email you a report with a lot of information about your soil, as well as customized recommendations. This, I think it's a good investment because you can save money by finding out what your soil needs and what it doesn't need and targeting what you add. 
And if that isn't in your budget, many garden centers will do a simple, quick soil test that will at least give you the major nutrient levels in your soil. So you have some idea if there's something missing. So you can um, check with your extension office if you're interested in purchasing one. To purchase one from them, you'll save the shipping that you do if you order it online. All right, a question I get a lot and um, is when to prune hydrangeas. And I'll start by saying it depends. People are often frustrated or disappointed because they want to have a show like you see in the bottom left or, or in the upper right too. Um, and they don't get that many blooms. These um, large leaf begonias that have the blue and pink blossom um, are not extremely hardy here. And so um, they need a little bit extra TLC. Even the ones like Endless Summer that say bloom on new or old wood, um, depending on where you've got them placed, that may or may not be true. So it is my recommendation that you wait until Mother's Day this year to prune last year's hydrangea growth. And that's the reason why. If you prune before that, and then you get a, we get a cold snap, you can, be, you can lose the blooms that you would have this year. That's true for, like I said, these hydrangeas and the oak leaf hydrangeas, the other one on the bottom right. If you've got the hydrangeas with the um, white ball or panicle blossoms, those are, not, those are much hardier and you are much less likely to have problems getting a good blossom display with those. So they're much less fussy about not pruning them. And I say Mother's Day because by then we're down to about a 50% chance of a frost. And if we get one, you could toss a sheet or a blanket or something over the hydrangeas and, and protect them from getting frosted. But if the frost settles on those buds that were um, established la in last year's growth, you will kill them. Um, and then you will end up without as many blossoms as you would like to have. So a little bit more about pruning, and I'm gonna start in the upper right on this slide because this could be your hydrangea. Um, and with a hydrangea, if you, you're waiting um, until Mother's Day, it will be very clear where the dead is, the brown part, the, um, and then that's a good place to make your pruning cut. These dark bar lines are showing you, I love you the pruning cut, and you'll notice that they're angled. And the angle is to, so that moisture doesn't sit on that cut. Um, and that angle should be facing the outside of the shrub, if at all possible. So prune back um, to healthy tissue. And you can see on this diagram, it's showing the buds that are still there that should give you blossoms this year. And this is true not just for hydrangeas, but other shrubs that you have that come from a crown like this. The alternate is the type of shrub where we have multiple stems coming from the root system through the soil. This is recommended that we do thinning cuts that we prune out some of the old stems to keep the plant um, healthy and keep that root system active in sending out new growth. The uh, um, ideal is to prune out up to a third of those old stems on a yearly basis. Um, if you, it's not recommended that you do this kind of a heading rounded cut that you see on the right, or it says, do not do this. This creates more maintenance because it spurs growth, side growth right along the top. Sometimes that can end up looking really funny. Um, this is a healthier way 
to do it is to remove stems all the way to the ground. With <laughs> evergreens, hedges, we have this tendency to do them in the inverted pyramid, which, and what happens is that the sunlight hits the top, but not, doesn't get down to the bottom. And then we get dieback on the bottom. How many of you have seen evergreen shrubs? And it doesn't have to be a hedge, but just a shrub where the top is full, but underneath all you see are the bare branches. If you can do pruning, as you see on the left, where the wider part is at the bottom at the soil level, then the sun can reach more of the plant and you get more growth. And then the other one I want to mention is prune candles. If you have, or not prune, pine. Um, if you have mugo pines um, or you want to manage the size of a, a larger pine, the best, the ideal time to do that is when they're sending out the candles in spring, that new growth, before it gets fully expanded, cut off about half of that candle. Um, that can help prevent an insect that can get into the stems of the mugo pines, and it helps you keep the size as a fit for your landscape. And then um, this is more about um, pruning and I'm, hang on a minute, I'm looking at my, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna zip past this one. I can answer people's questions later, but I wanna give you time for questions and answers. So I'm going to just um, flip through a couple of slides here. And I encourage you to invite beneficial insects into your landscape. And a reminder that less than 1% of all of the insects in our world are pests. And you, I would encourage you to look online for this bulletin you see on the screen. If you do a search for it, or I can send you to the link to it. It's a great um, booklet, pamphlet uh, that um, gives you blossoms that support the benefic different beneficial insects, their blossom times, um, what requirements they have. It's really a nice, nice bulletin. And an encouragement to invite the pollinators to your landscape. We all have heard how much they are, how much, how important they are to our landscapes, to our food sources. So, um, feed them, house them, and don't kill them. And then I'm going to just zip through. Like I said, you'll get this so you can look through it. Provide housing and water, different levels, different types. And this will be in the presentation um, when I send it out to you. Take a look at this and then see how many of these you have in your landscape. I would say if you've got 10 or more, you're doing really, really well at providing habitat to encourage those beneficials and um, pollinators to come. And then a question I'm getting a lot of um, <laughs> interest in. We've all seen in the media the talk about this is the um, hatch of the 17 year cicada. The 17 year is the brood X, the one you see in yellow that will be hatching this year. As you can see, it, most of the population will be south of us. Um, and just a reminder, yes, they're noisy. Um, they don't bite. They don't carry diseases. They don't kill plants. They are not the locusts of big, biblical um, story, uh, or biblical, uh, not story, but in the Bible. So just, I've had people say to me, oh, I'm not going to be gardening this year because we're going to have a cicada hatch. Um, no, you don't need to do that. They, they won't hurt you, it will be okay. We will live until 2022, we hope. If you're planning to start seeds, do your vegetable gardening, now's a great time to start tomato and pepper seeds. This is a great how-to about starting seeds indoors. And then critters, we could do a whole talk on this one. Um, I would say um, you probably have many of these repellent plants 
can keep critters from your tasty plants. And these are some of the more common ones. This is oregano. And, and be aware, that does grow as a ground cover. It will spread. But if you grant, have, are able to grow it around plants that the deer like, it can hide the scent of the tasty ones. The other thing I would say is now, spring is the time to protect your plants from the very beginning. When those hosta start to peak above ground, protect them. Because once the deer are creature of habit, once they find tasty plants, they'll be back. So if you can hide them early on, you can save yourself a whole lot of frustration later. And then this one, this slide we could spend a whole day on. One of the things that I will say is milorganite fertilizer. Make, put a circle of it around those hosta that they love. That smell can keep them away from your hosta. Um, and then there are any number of other things. Some work for some people, some don't for some people. The products like the Animal Stopper, I like granules um, because I can spread a border out away from a plant. And they seem to, to me, they last a little bit longer. This is one of the ones that doesn't gag you when you smell it. It has peppermint and other herbal scents in it and it's enough to keep them away. Um, and there are multiple brands that have the same ingredients. If you have had salt dive damage this winter from um, snow plows or sidewalks at work, if you see something that looks like this, um, the best thing I can say is flush water through the soil as soon as that soil is thawed. And if you can wash that salt off any plant tissue, if it hasn't killed it, it may save it and it may recover a little bit. But the two of these are from snowplow throwing salt. And the other one is from salt in an office building being used to clean a sidewalk. Okay. So that's the slide presentation. I'll give you a minute. My, um, you're going to get things emailed to you. You may also contact me at secretgardens11 at gmail or call me. And I am going to stop sharing and we'll see what questions I did not answer already that I can answer for you. Thank you, Linda. That was great. I saw people eagerly taking notes about deer deterrence. Lots of people were writing down <laughs> oregano and milogranite. Um, so I, I'm going to start there and ask my own question before some in the chat. You mentioned hiding the hostas from uh -huh. the deer, and I know people from Marshall need to know this. So um, <laughs> when you say hide the hostas, what do you suggest we hide them? Okay. You can hide them in several ways. One, you can use the um, milorganite or the animal stopper granules to make a circle um, that's about um, 18 to two feet wide around the plant. And don't do it right up against the plant. Do it, leave a little bit of space. That scent can trick them. They may miss your hostas. Um, the, those products have to be reapplied Growing oregano, if you have a way to stop the oregano from spreading beyond where you want it to go, that you can use as a ground cover, that can hide it. I plant alliums, the smaller spring blossoming allium bulbs in my hosta plants. They come up first, they blossom in the spring before the trees are all leafed out and they hide the scent of those hostas and it works really well. And it's fun because people look at my hostas and go, what, are they blooming already? That doesn't look like a hosta blossom. So if you like to have fun with your gardening, that's a good way to do it. Now that doesn't hold, the alliums don't hold that garlicky scent all summer. So starting midsummer, I have to do something else, but it gets through that critical time when the leaves are tiny and they are so tasty to the deer and the rabbits. 
Thank you. That sounds like a really fun answer to, to incorporate the alliums. I appreciate that. Uh, lots of good questions in the chat and I'm, I've got some here for you. Um, do you have some recommendations of best living mulches? Um, my number one choice would be alyssum. That is small annual ground cover that um, it's, <laughs> you, you find it at every garden center, everywhere, um, several different colors. And the reason is it's a really hardy grower, requires very little moisture, and it does attract the beneficial insects, which can help eat or feed on the um, predatory insects that you don't want in your garden. So that would be my number one choice. There are no, uh, the slide showed petunias. Um, any, I mean, really anything that works as a ground cover um, and has blossoms that are going to attract a variety of insects and pollinators will work. And I would say that bulletin I shared from MSU will have some suggestions in it too. Great, and we'll send a link to that, that as well. Okay. Um, is wood ash good for some plants? I recommend that um, wood ash has some benefit, yes. I recommend that you add it to a compost pile. Um, then it's, you're not, you have to be careful with wood ash that you don't get too much. It can become toxic. So if you're adding some to a compost pile where you're adding all kinds of other things, then the risk of adding too much wood ash is gone. And it has a chance to break down and incorporate in. I would say the same thing. A lot of people I know collect coffee grounds and they've asked about using that as a mulch put it in your compost pile. Um, let it break down with the other things. I know people, the coffee grounds can actually inhibit the growth of some plants. Too much of it can be too much of it and the plants don't like it. So um, adding it to compost is the safest way to go. Great. Um, if you're using preen, how do you keep it away from the existing plants in the area? If so, you would lay down the preen on the open soil around those other plants. So make sure the weeds are pulled out of those and you've got just the bare soil showing and that's where you put down the preen. Now that won't stop a weed from maybe sprouting up inside a plant, one of the plants in your garden. That you'll just have to remove by hand. Um. Is there an ingredient that you suggest we look for as a grub killer to rid moles? There are several different products available that all work very well. And I will add this to the list of things I send to you because the different products work best if they're applied at different times. There are some for spring, some for summer, um, some for fall, not so many for fall. That's not the best time to do it. But let me just share that document with people because it really, they are, they are time sensitive. Or they're soil temperature sensitive or they're sensitive to where the insect is in its life cycle. So that's the, without going into a whole long explanation, let me do that. Great. That sounds great. And, um, there was also the question of when to apply Grub X. Maybe that will be. Uh, yeah, why don't we, but that will be in that handout. Um, since it's, it's too early to do it now, then we've, they can, people can wait a few days and we'll get that out to them. Good. And a tree question, um, wondering how frequently to water new trees in say year two, year three, year four? Mm -hmm. Um, a great question. And I'm going, my, my answer will even go beyond year four, five, six. Um, that first couple of years, when 
the soil when I mean we as gardeners we pay attention to the weather we know right right now our soil is dry even though it's still frozen it's dry because we just don't have much haven't had much moisture um, so watch the soil in that plant um, planting hole around your tree and if if it's dry if we, um, it doesn't hurt to add a little bit of water. And if you've planted with that mulch over the top, that helps reduce the evaporation. I also, when I'm plant making planting a tree for the first time, I make a little moat around the outside of that planting hole mm -hmm. so that moisture can collect there and then percolate down into the roots. That helps. So it's, there's no definitive answer. It would depend on whether you've got an irrigation system that runs in that area. If not, um, but one of the best thing you can do to establish good tree health and shrub health is to make sure that they don't get, the soil doesn't get bone dry for any period of time. And most of the plants, some plants will let us know they will wilt, but many of them do not. So just be alert, um, keep an eye on them, make them your special buddies for the first couple of years. <laughs> That's great. And then I'm going to real quickly, when we get drought, even mature trees need water. And if we've had drought, um, for let's say three weeks and the weather people are talking about it and they're saying they're showing you maps of drought um, across this area. Think about watering your trees. It's very simple to do. You can put a soaker hose about halfway between the trunk and the outer reach of the canopy. If it's a mature tree, let that soaker hose run overnight. If it's a smaller tree, let it run for several hours so that you are really getting moisture down into that full root zone. They, their roots, once they're established, their roots go deep and so they can tolerate light drought. But um, if, if we get serious drought, think about giving them some water, especially the ones that have extra value to you in your landscape. Terrific. Um, do you have an opinion about fertilizers that contain crabgrass inhibitors? I there are a lot of them. Um, if you have already purchased it for this year, go ahead and use it. I am not suggesting you get rid of it any other way. Um, it's it's and there are, <laughs> every brand has some of that. Um, what we do here is the crabgrass preventer when the time is right, and we then wait and fertilize until May. So we do separately. So that means two um, times you have to go around the yard. Maybe that's not practical for somebody. Um, so I would say I've shared the ideal. What works best for you um, is what you should go with. Does that make sense? How about that for a Real <laughs> political answer. <laughs> I I was going to comment that you should consider running, but I want to stay friends, so I, I wasn't going to. That was great. Um, I just had a, a question come in. Do you remove burlap from uh, small decorative trees when you plant them? That's that's another good question. Um, the goal. <laughs> and there isn't there isn't a set answer. You have to take a look at that root ball. What you don't want to happen, the worst thing that can happen is all of the soil in the root ball falls off and you have the roots all exposed. That sends that root ball into shock. Um, pretty I mean, it's already a shock to transplant it. So if you start to pull some of that burlap off and you can see often it's terrible soil, some often clay, and you can see big chunks of it falling off, stop, just leave the burlap. You may wanna cut some additional slits. The burlap will break down. Um, you cut some extra slits and, and the roots are, it's easier for them to get out through the burlap before it breaks down. 
Um, so it's a take a look at what you've got. If you can take that burlap off without it all falling apart, that's the ideal. And then take your fingers or you like this massage fingers here. Um, take those fingers and loosen the roots that are on the outside of the root ball so that they are starting to grow out and down a little more quickly. Does that make sense? It did. And I could sense other people feeling that <laughs> when you were doing it and just all of us wishing we had dirt under our fingernails a little bit. Yes. Yeah. We I can, can see the tactile it. tactile sense is there. We can imagine it, can't we? Yeah. I could see it in some faces and I was feeling that. Um, there's a really interesting question. There is a guest in the, in the chat asking, they'd like to go greener and they uh -huh. live in the city. Um, because they live in the city, they have to be mindful that their yard doesn't just look like it's all native grasses and plants. So two parts, how do you ungrass sections of mm -hmm. your yard? Mm -hmm. And are there native plant species you would recommend they get started with? Um, yes, and I, yeah. Um, first, if, if you like the look, of grass. There are two native grasses that are hardy in our area that are what are called low grow or no mow grass. Um, Pennsylvania sedge and buffalo grass. And I am slowly encroaching upon my husband's lawn with these grasses. They only grow um, Oh, what, four, maybe six inches tall, and then they flop over. They're, um, and they fill in. And they, I think the planting recommendation is they get planted about a foot apart. And it makes this beautiful, soft um, look. It's not a manicured lawn, but it is grass. So if, you know, it would be, a, it's a good solution for a city, if you like that. Um, I, I can also try, I'm trying to think what I ha can share. Let me, let me find something to share about other ground covers that might be good alternatives for um, lawn in a city lot that are native, um, okay. Linda, can you repeat the two grasses that you just yes. shared? Yes, Pennsylvania sedge and buffalo grass. And those, um, you may, I don't know where in the Marshall area, who, what garden centers might carry those, someplace that carries a lot of native plants. The, la the bed I put in last summer, I or ended up ordering mine online because that was where I could find them last year. So, but ask at a garden center and maybe they will get them for you. Um, like other grasses, they like sunshine, but they're a little more tolerant of a little bit of shade than our turf grasses are. So it's a, it's a good alternative. Great. And this last question I have may, maybe the garden club leadership would like to answer because it's local. Um, the question is, is the opinion of folks that the Marshall City compost is of decent quality? Yeah, I wouldn't know. So I'll let somebody else handle that one. Um, who wants I, this? Who wants this one? I'm answering. Uh, you hear me? Yes. Hello, Gillespie. Okay. I, I take out about, I don't know, five, six truckloads out pretty much every year. And I think it's pretty good, but you got to get it when they've uh, turned it over with the front end loader or it's broken down. And you got to hunt around for those spots, but once you find it, it's almost like they say black gold. So it's very, to me, very rich and easy to work, spread around. So I've had uh, very good results with it. And I see um, so Natalie. One Rector. other thing. 
commented oh, also that the finished compost is good. So there yeah. seems to be agreement. Yeah. Okay. I just went on the city website and they're asking for the punch cards again this year. Last year, because of the COVID, we didn't need them. It's back in motion 2021. Carla, do you have any uh, further questions for Linda or do you want to move on to other garden club business? I'll let you take it from here. We'd like to thank Linda for this amazing presentation and should make sure you can hear me. Yes, thank you. It was a joy to be with you. I love to talk gardening anytime, day or night. <laughs>